From the trenches of the Great War, Wilfred Owen wrote some of the most moving, haunting, and terrifying war poetry ever composed. Today we'll take a look at what's arguably his most famous piece. Welcome to a reading, summary, and analysis of Wilfred Owen's Dulce et Decorum Est. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks, knock-kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and toward our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling, and floundering like a man in fire or lime, dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. And all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If, in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, Obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie, dulce et decorum est, pro patre mori. So before we get into the summary of the poem, I want to take a second to look at the author's life. Now, I'm not usually really focused on biographical criticism in these videos, but in this instance, Wilfred Owen's personal story really plays into how you read this piece. Owen was a soldier of the Great War, and he was killed one week before the end of the war. He only published five poems during his lifetime, and yet he went on to be known as one of the greatest war poets in all of the English language. At only 25 years old, Owen could have been considered someone who hadn't seen a lot of the world. But one thing that he had seen was war. So when we read Owen's war poetry, we are really seeing the war through someone who lived it, who saw it in all its brutality up close and personal. And this highly visual style is brought right into the poem from the very first line. You can see at the beginning of the poem that these are young men who have been reduced by war to being bent over like old beggars, and their knees are knocking together and they are coughing like old witch-like women as they curse their way through the sludge. Then in line three, we get the haunting flares that they turn their backs on. And this is something that I didn't actually realize until I looked more into this poem, is that flares were used during the Great War to basically light up no man's land. I assumed this was like anti-aircraft and it could be used for that, Uh, as well. But for the most part, it was used to basically light up the night so that if enemy soldiers were trying to cross no man's land or move positions, they could be shot at. And that must just be incredibly terrifying that even at night, you have just these artificial lights up in the sky as people are are taking aim at you. It's it's a, a warfare that must have just been incredibly, incredibly difficult from a psychological standpoint the shell shock as they called it back then. We get more details about the men. They are marching asleep, meaning they are so exhausted they're basically walking in their sleep. They've lost their boots, but they are now bloodshod. To shod something means to make a shoe for it. Usually we talk about that with like horses. So they are wearing shoes of blood, basically. They've been made lame and blind and drunk with fatigue and deaf and this is the important point, deaf to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. The only, like, peaceful word in this entire stanza is softly, and it's about gas shells. 
Then the poem kicks into high gear. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling. So there's a gas attack that happens, and poisonous gas is something that was considered so heinous that after World War I, it was outlawed and like the Geneva Conventions that you could not use it in warfare. I'll repeat that, this is a weapon so brutal, so horrible in the way that it takes human life that it is considered too destructive for war something in which you are trying to destroy the enemy. This is considered that horrible. And you can see why, as you read this piece, they're, they're fitting their helmets on just in time, but someone does not. And he's yelling and stumbling and floundering like he's almost drowning in this gas. And lime is a very dangerous chemical substance for humans. We use it in like gardening and to like destroy the smell of like horrible things like trash or or decomposing carcasses or something like that. And it, it burns. So you can see this person is breathing this stuff in. And the speaker dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea sees the person who didn't get his mask on in time drowning, drowning in the very air. Then we get a change out of the action of the poem and more of a recollection. In this person's dreams, he has this sort of survivor's guilt and sees the person who died or the person who was greatly injured plunging at him. Guttering is a tricky word. Uh, it's, it's not really an actual word that we would use in this instance. It more means like the gutters on like a house or a building, but it could be crying or sweating or even just like the sound of the words guttering, like like coming from the gut, the air being exhaled from the person who's a victim of this gas attack here and choking and drowning. So it's all just incredibly visceral. And then we get another change with this stanza. All of a sudden, the speaker is talking to us. And he says that if in some smothering dreams, right, smothering is like suffocation. So this is not a pleasant dream. In a smothering dream, if you too could pace behind the wagon we flung him in, so the wagon that would have carried his body away from what happened, and watch the white eyes writhing, twisting and squirming in his face. Uh, then we're told his face is like a devil that has sinned so much it is sick of sinning. And then we get the sounds of this person. At every jolt of the wagon, blood is gargling from the froth corrupted lungs. Right, to gargle means to like hold liquid in your mouth or upper throat. It's not something the person is doing on purpose. It's it's just liquid coming out of their lungs. It's described as, as cancer, obscene as cancer, and bitter is the cud, and cud is partially digested food that's regurgitated by an animal for further chewing. I mean, this is as gross and disgusting as Owen can possibly describe it, because we cannot actually see this happen. As civilians, we cannot see this happen, but he has. Him and his fellow soldiers have seen the gas attacks, have seen soldiers suffer from them, have seen, you know, the psychological turmoil of this trench warfare. And this poem is offered as a warning because it says, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest, great enthusiasm and energy to children ardent, glowing with enthusiasm and passion for desperate glory, the old lie, dulce et decorum est pro patre mori. So basically, it's saying here that if you saw what I saw, you would never tell children who are desperate for the glory of war the old lie. And we'll explain what that lie means. It needs its own its own page here. But I want you to think about that, the, the idea of, of glory through warfare. Warfare is still very interesting to kids for the most part. Video games are marketed through warfare. That's predominantly what is taught in schools, at least in the United States, is studying the different wars. It's something people are drawn to. From a distance, it's full of action and excitement. Up close, it's like the worst part of humanity. And that's what Owen puts on display here. So let's take a look at that Latin phrase there. This comes from Horace, who was a soldier, poet, and eventual senator in ancient Rome. And what this means, roughly translated, is it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. And this makes sense why Rome would pitch something like this, right, as they're trying to conquer the known world through their citizen soldiers. But that doesn't mean it's true, just because it came from antiquity. And Horace is a great writer. 
uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's true. And I, I don't know if he wrote this before or after he lost uh, in the Battle of Philippi, but um, either way, he said that it's sweet and fitting to die for one's country. And what Owen says is this is an old lie that people tell children. And it goes all the way through human history from what was at that time the modern war of the Great War all the way back to ancient Rome that people have been pitched this lie that the best thing you could do is go die for your country. And what, what Owen says is no, he, he rejects that entirely, he says that is a lie. There's nothing sweet or fitting about war and the way that it eats up its country's children. This poem always reminds me of the famous war novel from World War I, All Quiet on the Western Front, specifically the section where the protagonist and his fellow schoolmates are encouraged to go to war by their teacher. No! No, Paul! I've been there! I know what it's like! That's not what one dwells on, Paul! I heard you in here reciting that same old stuff, making more iron men, more young heroes. You still think it's beautiful and sweet to die for your country, don't you? Well, we used to think you knew. The first bombardment taught us better. It's dirty and painful to die for your country. When it comes to dying for your country, it's better not to die at all. The teacher is too old to go and fight in the war, but he encourages them to go. And that's what I think this old lie comes into here is that parents or grandparents or authority figures who are not going to actually be, or politicians, who are not actually going to be fighting in the war personally are pushing the youth toward it. Oh, but if you'll pardon me, it's easier to say go out and die than it is to do it. Coward! And it's easier to say it than to watch it happen. And the youth don't have as much perspective. And, and maybe the parents don't have as much perspective either. You know, when you think of To My Sweet Old Etc. by E.E. E. Cummings, you have the parents who hope their son will die honorably in the war. At least that's how the speaker sees it. At the end of the day, war is something that should be avoided at all cost. And we shouldn't trust an old Roman poet senator we should probably trust the people who saw war up close and personal, like Wilfred Owen. And um, unfortunately, he didn't survive the war, but he left us with a lot of wisdom and warning as to what war creates, and we would be fools to not take him at his word. A couple other interesting things about this poem is just some of the themes that we see. There's definitely this theme of drowning throughout the poem, this water here that we have. As under a green sea, I saw him drowning. Drowning gets repeated in the next stanza. And then the blood that comes gargling from the froth corrupted lungs. So you see this instance of, of water, and what this kind of makes me think of is that when water is talked about, it's, it's unstoppable in poetry. You can look at the end of Child Harold's Pilgrimage by Lord Byron, where he sees everything in the world, but it's the sea that really takes his breath away because humans can never conquer the sea. And likewise, when we are stuck out in the water, it is an unstoppable force. And death in war is, is an unstoppable force. War is unstoppable for a single person. They can't do anything about it. They are drowning in the war, so to speak. And the people who have the powers to stop the war, the people who are in charge of the military or the government, are not the ones on the front line drowning in the war. They're at a distance making the decisions. Another theme that we see throughout this poem is sleep. We have men march to sleep and all my dreams, and if in some smothering dream you too could pace behind the wagon. And sleep is an interesting theme here. It's, it's something that should be restful, but it can also easily become terrifying. Dreams can become nightmares. We're also very susceptible during our sleep. It's a time where we have to trust those around us because we are not aware of what's happening around us. And these soldiers, their trust is in their generals and in their politicians. And clearly that trust has been misplaced based on how World War I went and how many thousands upon thousands of young men died over a few miles of mud. It's also obviously sleep a euphemism for death, uh, and it definitely hangs over this poem. The survivor of the poem is the speaker, and even though he survives the gas attack, he is left with scars of his own. I mean, the poem starts off pretty bad. They're not in a good spot when it starts, 
and it ends, you know, even worse. And perhaps because this poem is so visual, it has just really captivated audiences. I can think of two really excellent examples of artists who have taken the words of this poem and brought them to life in a, in a visual sense anyway. One is a comic strip or like sort of a graphic novel approach, and the other one is from the Poetry Foundation where they uh, take three World War one poems and link them together into one piece. I believe it's the Owl, uh, Dulce at Decorum Est, and In Flanders Field. And it's all done through puppets, which you would think would be kind of silly, but it's incredible puppetry um, and a phenomenal little short movie. So I'll link both those in the description because they're both definitely worth checking out. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments, and I hope that uh, you were able to get something out of this. Uh, it's a tough poem, but it's one that I think we need to listen to. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Happy reading.